Good evening and welcome. I am delighted to welcome you to our completed life February town hall on palliative sedation. My name is Sarah Kiskadden Bechtel, and I'm the program director of the Completed Life Initiative. Tonight, I am honored to be joined by speakers Dr. Timothy Quill, who is Professor Emeritus at the University of Rochester Medical Center, and David Hoffman who is a Columbia University lecturer in bioethics and chief compliance officer at Carthage Area Hospital. Tonight, Dr. Quill and Professor Hoffman will be taking a deep dive into the realm of palliative sedation and will discuss the perhaps surprising level of variability, scope, and nuance within palliative sedation. This practice is often a last resort option for pain management ranging from regular sedation, that is sleeping aids, proportionate sedation, that is from mild to moderate to severe palliation, to finally complete sedation, that is from complete wakefulness directly into sleep. Before we turn to Dr. Quill to begin his presentation, let me briefly mention that a recording of tonight's town hall will be available shortly after the event concludes. Throughout tonight's event, we welcome you to submit your questions for Dr. Quill and Professor Hoffman into the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. And any technical issues, should they arise, please also um, message them to me as well. Um, and now over to Dr. Quill. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, this afternoon or this evening, wherever you are. And uh, I look forward to uh, um, talking with you about this, uh, uh, David and I are going to present some thoughts and ideas, and then hopefully uh, we'll have interaction with you all as we as we go through. Uh, we're going to be talking about palliative sedation as a last resort uh, palliative uh, option, and so we'll talk more about that as we go forward. Next slide. Uh, I don't have any uh, significant financial conflicts of interest, uh, as many of you may know. I'm an advocate of legal access to palliative sedation and other means for addressing unacceptable suffering, particularly at the end of life. So I'm gonna start with three uh, real cases. Uh, I, there are a lot of them that I could have presented, but I thought I'd try to give you a range of uh, what this might look like. And I'll present the cases, uh, how they presented at the start of this, and then we'll come back and visit them about how uh, uh, my colleagues and I went about uh, addressing what was going on. Next slide. So the first case uh, was a 90-year-old Holocaust survivor who was dying of a congestive heart failure. Uh, she was in our um, uh, hospital in our palliative care unit, and she had uh, severe delirium as her blood pressure dropped. She she was having shortness of breath and and hypotension. She was uh, do not resuscitate and do not intubate, so she did not want to go on to machines. But as her blood pressure dropped, she started having uh, uh, hallucinations and nightmares from delirium uh, because she wasn't getting enough oxygen to her brain. And those hallucinations uh, brought back memories of her times uh, in the death camps uh, uh, during World War II. So it was a very disturbing uh, 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 scenario. Her paranoia and agitation, we tried to relieve this with uh, mild sedatives and anti-anxiety medications, antipsychotic medications, and, and it was not working. So this was what I call a, a, a major palliative care emergency. The next case, uh, and again, we'll all come back to these cases in, uh, as we go forward uh, later on and, and say how we resolve them. Next case was a 65-year-old uh, man with lung cancer who had severe shortness of breath. He had been on a mechanical ventilator uh, in the past and had had a long and difficult uh, wean. So he, had been, he was on the ventilator for a long time where we're eventually able to get him off without having to uh, put him permanently on with a tracheostomy. Uh, but he was now terrified of severe shortness of breath uh, he did not want to go back on the ventilator. He did not want to be resuscitated. Uh, so uh, he, but he lived in fear of what would happen uh, 
uh, when and if he became short of breath. And as, as some of you may know, when, when breathing gives out, it tends to give out rather suddenly. You get short of breath suddenly, and really that's a, that is something to be worried about. Uh, often we have to put people on ventilators just because the sensation of shortness of breath is so severe. So he was worried about that, wanted to talk about what possibilities he might have for addressing this should it happen. And then the third case uh, was a 48-year-old nurse who had uh, severe intractable depression. Uh, he had had it throughout uh, his life, most of his adult life. He had been hospitalized numerous times with suicidal ideation. He had tried multiple antidepressant medications and had several courses of shock therapy over the last 10 years, which kept his depression at bay most of the time. He spoke uh, compellingly about his uh, intractable suffering from this depression, and he wanted to know if there was some way that he could be sedated to escape his, his suffering. So he was asking for sedation to escape his intractable psychic suffering. So three very different cases. So I'm gonna uh, review a little bit about palliative care uh, uh, to start with, uh, just to say that when we take care of uh, people who are really sick using palliative care and, and hospice, we are generally uh, doing really wonderful things. A lot of it is very uh, exciting and meaningful. Some of it's very mundane, but still very meaningful to those who are in the midst of it. So this man uh, is probably playing cards uh, and, and uh, being with his wife and uh, his extended family. And this is time that this family will, will never forget. Even though his time may be limited, this is a very meaningful time uh, that we all cherish. Next slide. To go through these, uh, these times without being overwhelmed with symptoms, you need people involved in your care who have expertise. Uh, generally, uh, many of these people work in palliative care or in hospice. Uh, and they become very expert at not just treating the disease, but also at managing symptoms. And some of the symptoms are pain, some of them are shortness of breath, some of them are delirium. There's a wide range, and any one of those, if really uh, getting out of whack, out of control, can dominate your experience and make it not as comfortable or meaningful as it might otherwise be. So when we use medicine's powers to keep people comfortable for the last part of their life and allow them to die peacefully, and this is an image of somebody who is dying peacefully, I think we're doing a wonderful thing. And again, our, our colleagues in hospice and palliative care have really learned a lot about this process, taught us a lot about this process, and it's very rich and meaningful work for those of you who, who aren't part of this world uh, ordinarily. Next slide. So why are palliative care options of last resort important? So many people are very worried about uh, a bad death. One bad death, uh, if you've seen in your extended group of friends or colleagues or family, really uh, has a profound effect on everybody who witnesses that. They, are, they kind of worry, well, what if I get into that situation uh, during the end of my time? Or what if somebody I love, my, my mate or my parents or my... Uh, sick children or whoever it might be. What are, what, what's that going to be like if they get into that bad situation? So some, how are that, how are those severe potential suffering going to be addressed? What kind of escape can I have? Uh, those possibilities are very lively for people who've witnessed these kinds of experience. And again, I bet if you all work it throughout your own extended family and friends, you can probably find some examples of a situation that you say, oh boy, if I got into that situation, that would be pretty rough. So for many of these people, awareness of what options they might have, uh, these are very important uh, to the patient themselves, to their families, and to their caregivers, just to know that there could be a way to get through that if they end up in their worst case scenario. Now, some of the time when people are ending up in, in severe suffering, it's because they're not getting adequate palliative care. So again, the first place you look at somebody suffering in a way that seems extreme is to redouble your efforts to relieve their symptoms and try to help them feel better and less symptom, symptomatic. So uh, for example, if they aren't having access to care, you know, if they're uh, 
uh, don't have insurance, we got to get them into care, got to get, get them into the right program so that they can be seeing people who have expertise. We uh, uh, don't ever graduate clinicians who are not able to do the basics of biomedicine, but we routinely graduate a number of clinicians who don't learn how to do the basics of symptom management. And that's really a travesty, in my opinion. That should be as important as learning how to uh, uh, treat underlying diseases. And then we have barriers to pain management. Of course, we have the drug abuse epidemic going on right now, which has made people extremely uh, anxious about strong pain medicine. And that's that wariness may be uh, justifiable in some circumstances, but at the very end of life, we really want to make sure that people have access to the best possible pain management. And some of the worries about addiction and overuse are much less relevant at the very end of life. Reimbursement uh, incentives are, are pretty uh, out, out of whack right now. We are willing to pay a lot uh, to put people through even long shot aggressive medical treatment. Uh, but if, again, people transition to comfort care or other kinds of uh, treatment, we don't uh, have those same kinds of reimbursements. And if they need a lot of support, need to go to a nursing facility, again, we don't have very strong systems for helping paying for that. And when we do uh, offer palliative care, it's often very late uh, when the wheels are falling off. Uh, and, and again, could be much better served by offering it from the beginning, maybe alongside the aggressive treatment. And again, we give uh, clinicians, particularly physicians, a pass if they're not uh, being very skillful at palliative care. Uh, we wouldn't give them the same pass if they weren't being skillful about underlying medical care, but that pass really needs to stop. Uh, this has to be just seen as a core medical commitment. And of course, if you happen to be black or poor in this country, you're not worried about getting palliative care. You're worried about getting into care in the first place worrying about getting into treatment. So these, these questions are much less relevant, even though they may be relevant, because uh, if you're not getting good medical care, you're probably not going to get good palliative care either. Next slide. So there are, there are also, so the first step is to make sure people are getting adequate palliative care, but there are also some limitations in palliative care that are not correctable. So when we tell people, that we can relieve 100% of their suffering, I think, frankly, they fr we frighten some people. So many people have also seen hard suffering, perhaps, uh, of a patient on, on hospice, so that we're getting the best care, but they still were having a very hard time. So we need to learn how to uh, acknowledge exceptions when they occur, the hard situations that sometimes occur despite good care. And some of those hard situations are uncontrolled physical symptoms, hard to control pain, harder to control shortness of breath, maybe delirium toward the very end of life. And then if we're gonna talk about suffering, we have to include psychosocial, existential, and spiritual suffering. And the notion that we would have simple answers for those dimensions of suffering, I think would be, would be not very reassuring because there aren't simple answers often. And then the kind of dependency and side effects of some of our treatments, high dose opioids, for example, to manage pain, are gonna make people very dependent and, and that's, that's a tough nut to swallow for a lot of people who are used to being very independent. And if we have, you know, if a, if a patient is saying, I'm ready to stop life supports, uh, we can say, okay, well, listen to the patient if that happens, but a patient who's suffering maybe two or three times more, but doesn't have a life support to stop and they say, you know, I'm ready to go now, uh, then we might say, well, they, they're just too weak. They should try harder. That, that's not something that clinicians should do. So we have some, some differing values that really sometimes get in the way of being as responsive as we can be. And these are all domains that we need to work uh, harder on. But there are gonna be these some tougher situations. Imagine this man with either very advanced emphysema or perhaps advanced lung cancer, he's made a decision, he's not gonna go on a ventilator, and now his lungs are filling up with fluid, and, and you don't have to have a big imagination to, to think about how tough that's gonna be. This is akin to drowning. And if we don't have a plan for how we're gonna address this, people are gonna take a ventilator every time and get stuck on it, because being on a ventilator, even if you're not gonna get off, is better than drowning. So we need to have a plan for dealing with the tough situations. And of course, our palliative care and hospice colleagues have really come a long way in terms of developing these plans.
Next slide. So just a, a, a little bit of the symptoms of palliative care is either the symptoms of dying patients is weakness, pain, anorexia, constipation, cough, uh, uh, nausea, vomiting, confusion, fecal incontinence, odor. So there's a lot of symptoms. So these things all need to be kind of separated out and addressed as best they can be. And again, we, we've, be, we've developed some expertise in doing this, but it really requires some real commitment uh, to trying to relieve this as best we can. Next slide. So there are interlocking public policy uh, questions involved in, these, in this domain. How do we improve access to and delivery of palliative care to all seriously ill and dying patients? So again, you don't have to be dying. You don't even have to have stopped aggressive medical treatment to get good palliative care, but we should be able to deliver this to all patients who are really on the sicker end of the spectrum. And then how do we respond to those infrequent but troubling patients who are dying badly despite excellent treatment? So the first step is to make sure they're getting excellent medical care, excellent palliative care, excellent hospice care. And if they're still suffering badly, uh, then how, uh, how do we, should we address and respond to those situations? And then the third domain in this is should we respond to individual cases uh, under the radar screen kind of secretly, or should we develop public policy for how to do this? Because we, all, we get very uh, anxious when we're dealing with people who are saying, I'm ready to die now. Are we helping them to die? Are we allowed to do that? Of course, they're dying anyway, uh, but, but how doctors and clinicians are supposed to address this, we are filled with ambivalence uh, as a culture around how we see people doing this. So there's two aspects of this clinical, clinical question. Uh, what options do I have? You can hit, you'll have to just hit these one after the other a little bit. Hypothetically, if my dying becomes difficult in the future, so this is the hypothetical and many people are worried about this. Uh, and and uh, you can get people to talk about this, people on hospice, what kinds of deaths have you seen in your family? What are you most worried about? And, and most of the time, if we can reassure them that we'll be there with strong palliative care, that's all we need to do, but a smaller percentage will actually get uh, to the point where they're ready to die now because they're suffering, their situation is unacceptable. And these are tougher cases. Uh, these are uh, what I consider to be palliative care emergencies uh, toward the very end of life when suffering is really bad, prognosis is bad, and we don't have any easy answers. So the reassurance about the future, uh, again, people will talk about this. What kinds of deaths have you seen in your family? Uh, what, what are you most afraid of? And if we can commit to saying, I'll, I'll work with you and you can always call me or somebody is in charge with you uh, about how we're gonna address this, then, then we can reassure them that we'll be there for them uh, if something bad happens. Hopefully it won't happen if we give them the excellent palliative care all the way through. Next slide. Uh, and, and again, some of those patients will wonder uh, during this process, uh, what, it, what about could I have assistance in dying if it comes to that? When I, if I can de decide that I'm ready, am I allowed to do that? And there have been some surveys, surveys of terminally ill patients and how they feel about this. This is a survey of, of about 1,000 uh, patients, uh, uh, terminally ill patients who are on hospice. Uh, and about 60% supported the option of having an assisted death at the end of life. And about 10% of them eventually considered this, even though they may not have acted on it. In another study of a Catholic hospice of around 90 patients, 17% had a high desire for assisted dying. So again, this is part of the mix of people's thought uh, as at the very end of life. And in Oregon, where physician assisted death is legal, one in six uh, patients uh, who are terminally ill talk to their families about it. One in 50 talk to their doctors, but it only accounts to, for about one in 300 deaths. So there's a lot of worry about this, but in point of fact, uh, it only relatively rarely has to be acted upon. Of course, if you happen to be that one in 300, it's very important to you. Next slide. Who asks about assisted dying? It tends to be patients with cancer, uh, neurologic diseases, particularly ALS and AIDS. Uh, they tend to be white. Uh, they tend to be from Western culture. Uh, they are the haves, they have medical coverage and most have had access to hospice. So these are folks who are 
generally have access to good care. And what are their motivations for assisting, uh, for seeking a assisting, uh, hasten death, a potentially hasten death? Uh, it often has to do with being weak, tired, uh, being dependent. Uh, pain is still part of the puzzle in about 40% of cases, but as often as not, it's this loss of sense of self, this desire for, for control. Uh, and many people have had long-standing beliefs uh, that this should be part of the what they should have access to if they get sick. Uh, and then some fear about the future, fears about the quality of life and dying. Some have had negative past experiences with family members and others don't want to be a burden uh, on their uh, families. So one is the hypothetical worry. Uh, uh, you know, will you help me if things get bad? And that's having a conversation, try to be reassuring and making a commitment. Uh, but a smaller number are gonna say, I'm ready to die now. And, and what do we do when that happens? Well, the first step uh, is, is we're trying to understand what is the nature of the suffering? Is it, is it predominantly physical? Is it psychosocial? Is it a mix of physical and psychosocial issues? So we're gonna, explore the why now. And again, clinicians should be very good at this. This is what we teach medical students to do, you know, is, is to why, why is this coming up right now? What makes your situation most unacceptable to you? What have you tried so far? And sometimes it's uncontrolled symptoms, in which case the first answer is to redouble your efforts to try to manage those symptoms. Sometimes it's a psychosocial problem, uh, may have gotten depressed or your, your uh, Family may be getting tired managing your situation. It may be a spiritual or religious crisis. Uh, how could a caring God have allowed this to happen to me? Or it may be that a person's gotten clinically depressed or is having panic attacks, in which case addressing that depression and anxiety both biologically and psychologically would be the, the place to go. Uh, so, uh, when people are asking about now, we're gonna make sure palliative care is, is being delivered in, in the best possible way. And again, this would be a time if a general clinician was managing the case, you might get a specialist involved to make sure that, that they've looked at all the angles. And then you're gonna search for the least harmful alternative that respects the values of the major participants, make sure there's informed consent and that the immediate family is fully participatory in this process. And this is a list of potential, la what I call last resort options in sort of rough order of societal agreement about acceptability. Uh, so again, if somebody is, is uh, having pain, it's been uncontrolled or shortness of breath and they've been holding back on the, on the pain medicine, again, if this is happening, we're gonna then maybe uh, take a, a higher doses and take a little bit more risk of sedation uh, in order to give them some relief. And again, there's wide agreement that this is permissible uh, ethically in, in, in the United States. We're also going to take a look and see, are they on life prolonging therapy? So many times uh, simple life prolonging therapies may be prolonging the dying process. So if it's prolonging meaningful life, that's great. But if it's prolonging the dying process, then uh, it may be time to stop doing that. So are they on, for example, if somebody has been on dialysis and they're having this situation, could they stop the dialysis? Uh, or if they're on certain kinds of heart failure treatment or whatever it is, we're gonna look at all the treatments they're receiving and seeing if any of them are prolonging life. And if they're ready to die, then that might be something that they could stop. And again, wide societal agreement that that's permissible. The middle area are more controversial. Uh, the possibility of stopping uh, eating and drinking. Again, we, we have a new book coming out on this subject that we're exploring this in some detail from a clinical, ethical, legal, and policy point of view. Uh, but this is something that is within a, a patient's potential own control uh, and might be an option for them under these circumstances. And then if symptoms are severe, palliative sedation might be, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that might look like. Uh, uh, in a, in a few minutes. And then the more controversial zone at the bottom, uh, physician-assisted death, physician-assisted suicide, if you happen to live in Oregon or one of the states where this is legal in the US or if you live in the Netherlands, these practices might be permissible where a clinician could 
give a patient medicine that they could take as an overdose, that would be physician-assisted death, or voluntary active euthanasia. This would be a, a clinician being able to give a patient a lethal injection at a time of the patient's own choosing. Next slide. So there are three kinds of palliative sedation, and it's good to, good to distinguish between these three because they're very different. One is usual sedation, so anti-anxiety medicine or sleeping medicine. Uh, and again, when you give those medicines, this is just routine care. Uh, it's routine palliative care. It's routine care of people who are, are sick, and it's just ordinary practice. So that really doesn't require a special consideration. The middle zone proportionate palliative sedation is when you're trying to keep the, the level of sedation down, but you're willing to proportionally go up in that sedation until you get it to a level that makes the suffering acceptable. So again, it might, might be just a modest amount of sedation helps, maybe a moderate amount, or it might go all the way to sedation to unconsciousness, but if unconsciousness is a 10 out of 10, you're gonna to get to 10 by going one, two, three, four, and wait at each of those stages. So you're seeing it, it, trying to get the lowest dose that'll achieve an adequate effect. So we're trying to preserve consciousness if possible uh, at the same time that we're trying to address the suffering and minimizing the risk of hastening death. Then the third zone is palliative sedation to unconsciousness, where you might go on a sedation scale of zero being totally awake, 10 being totally sedated, where you go from zero to 10 in one step. This would be for palliative care emergencies, which we'll talk a little bit more about. But in this case, unconsciousness is the intended endpoint, and it's reserved for the severest kinds of physical suffering. So the intent is to relieve suffering, uh, and the intent around hastening death is a little bit more complex. Next slide. So some of the key elements, sedation potentially, uh, uh, potentially to unconsciousness with life supports being withheld. So we're not gonna put somebody on life support. We sometimes do sedate people to unconsciousness who are going through a rough patch, but we would then put them on a ventilator. And, and put them in the ICU. In this circumstance, you're not gonna do that because they're nearing the end of their life. We usually use benzodiazepines, things like Valium or uh, uh, Ativan or barbiturates. And the dying process, usually if you're getting sedated, usually is a matter of days to a few weeks, depending on how much sedation is required and also depending on what the underlying disease is. Um, you may be dependent on other life prolonging treatments that may be discontinued in this process if they are prolonging the dying process. If they're prolonging meaningful life, they would be continued. And the patient usually dies of dehydration or complications from their underlying disease. Uh, the patient, as sedation gets more deep, they're more unaware of their suffering. Uh, and uh, again, this is potentially available to decisionally capable pa patients. People are still making their own decisions. We could have a conversation about this. Or if somebody was delirious and agitated but couldn't make decisions, then we'd be making this decision with family. And this is accepted in most palliative care and hospice circles as part of what, what happens in, in, the, in the world that we live when we're dealing with palliative care emergencies. So the moral justification uh, the rule of double effect, uh, justifying the sedation. So your intent in giving this uh, rule of double effect comes from a Catholic moral tradition, but you don't have to be a Catholic to use it. Uh, it's, it can be helpful. So your intent is good to relieve suffering. You can see if you're going to say, say somebody that it might make them sleepy, might make them breathe less well, but that's not your intent. Your intent, your intent is to really help them feel better. So you're not ending their life to relieve their suffering. You're trying to relieve their suffering, uh, but you can see that some of the means you're doing this might, might uh, hasten death a small amount. And you're also looking at proportionality. So this is not for a little bit of suffering. This is for a harsher point kind of suffering where you have to take some risks of having an unintended bad effect. There's also withdrawal of life-sustaining therapies that can be done. Uh, uh, if you're gonna sedate somebody to unconsciousness, and you don't put them on a ventilator, chances are they're, they're, they're not going to survive. And again, the withdrawal or not using life-sustaining therapies, people have a right to say what treatments go into their bodies. Uh, and they can choose to not have them, even if their intent is to hasten death. And again, when we combine 
sedation and not using life supports, it gets a little bit more complicated in terms of the ethical justification, but still I think there's wide agreement that this is permissible. Uh, and, and the practice is uh, generally allowable in most parts of the US. So again, uh, reducing consciousness on persons and personhood, this is a little philosophical in, the, in this part, but for most of us, consciousness is very essential to a quality existence. So, um, you know, I think therefore I exist. So we're trying to preserve this as much as possible. And yet there is often trade-offs as death approaches because death, you are not conscious anymore. Uh, and again, as you approach it, often consciousness gets altered. Uh, so severe suffering is often associated with what's what Eric Cassell has called the disintegration of the person. You feel like you're falling apart. It's a very disturbing construct. Um, and it, it really says that um, reducing consciousness, if you're really falling apart, if you have that feeling, actually is a form of self-preservation. So you really, it's, it's the much lesser of two evils than, than uh, disintegration. And those who witness severe suffering are also disturbed by it. So again, we're, we're getting consent often from patients and families, but as patients lose their capacity, we're talking to families about this. And again, we have to explain why this is a part of the dying process, the lo losing consciousness. And sedation and even death may no longer be the enemy when suffering gets extreme like this. So there's a lot of issues that we, meaning doctors and family members, bring to this issue, we can call it counter-transference uh, based on our own experience. Uh, and we have to kind of sort through those and really keep the views and values of the patient in the center as much as possible. Uh, ethical dimensions of reducing consciousness. Again, we're gonna try to re, uh, not to reduce it if possible. That's why we do this proportionate sedation as a first step, usually rather than sedation to unconsciousness. Uh, but severe intractable suffering is a medical emergency, and we really have to look at all uh, options to, uh, to do this. And again, these options that do alter consciousness really should be seen as a last resort. Not impossible, but being provided expertly and carefully. I think it's ideal if we're going to use heavy sedation to get second opinions from experienced people, if possible. Again, that's not always possible but we really should be out in the open, try to document what we're doing, saying why we're doing it, so that if people second guess later on, they can really see what we were thinking at that time. Okay, I think this is my last slide before I go to David, if I'm not sure, if I'm not positive of this, but yep. uh, so should clinicians decide when suffering is severe enough? These are, these are questions. Again, I think we should be part of that discussion, but probably not the main, the main arbiters of that. Should patients uh, be the main decider when suffering is severe enough? Uh, if a patient would have preferred voluntary active euthanasia, but only sedation is illegally available, should, does that mean we shouldn't provide it because we're not supposed to provide euthanasia? And is uh, sedation to unconsciousness only available for severe unrelieved physical suffering in the terminally ill patients, or is there more flexibility in patient choice in both of these domains? So these are some of the questions that we'll begin to address as we get more in the interaction. So I think I'm going to shift right now and uh, hand the baton over to David. Thank you very much, Tim. That was absolutely remarkable. I, I don't think uh, our audience can appreciate just what a thorough and and grounded um, tour they just witnessed of the landscape of sedation of which palliative sedation is just a small part and of which palliative sedation to unconsciousness which we will refer to as PSU for the rest of the evening to save some time um, is an important but very limited uh, option for some reasons that we're going to get into now. So Tim did a wonderful job of outlining the range of issues from the patient's perspective. But as Tim suggested at the end of his presentation, uh, the clinician has some interest, um, emotional, philosophical, moral, in how these courses of treatment are played out uh, that I'm going to walk through because as a non-physician, I can look at this question with 
more objectivity and perhaps be an even stronger advocate for clinicians uh, than Tim is prepared to do in public. So what about the clinician's choice? Where does the doctor's interest and role and concerns come into this discussion? Um, as Tim pointed out, Patients can refuse treatment. It is one of the most basic principles of clinical bioethics that patients are allowed to make choices about their care, including bad choices. Bad choices obviously being defined in the pejorative sense, meaning choices that the clinician, the treating physician doesn't agree with or doesn't think is within the range of what is reasonable or appropriate. And yet, um, Physicians have an obligation to respect those choices so long as the patient has what we refer to as decisional capacity, meaning that they understand the medical facts, the circumstances that they are confronted with, and that they understand what the benefits and burdens of the different options are, and that they understand the reasons why their clinician is recommending a certain course of treatment. And if they're not going to accept that recommendation, the clinician has a real interest and in fact a right to be sure that the patient understands why the recommendation was being made and that the clinician has a right to understand why the patient is refusing it so that the clinician can make a judgment whether the refusal is a reasoned Reasoned, reason based, not necessarily reasonable as we use the term reasonable in a lay sense, but that the clinician has a real moral stake in being sure that the patient is reasoning their way to their decision, including reasoning their way to their decision by relying upon their faith. You can't reason your way to understand faith but you can reason about the basis for a person's faith-based decision. And when you get to the point where a clinician has concluded that the patient understands the implications of the decisions she or he is making, uh, then as a general proposition, the clinician has a responsibility, an obligation, a duty to support the choices that the patient makes. Next slide, Sarah. At the same time, um, if a patient isn't refusing care, but rather asking for care, including pain management, which is just a component of palliative care, but an important component, um, that's something that clinicians almost always want to respond to. Tim made the point that even in the face of the opioid crisis that we are confronting as a society, that ought not, as a moral proposition to be a central concern of a treating clinician who's managing a patient with a terminal illness, especially one who is very close to the end of their life. Um, pain management is considered an essential part of the standard of care, not something that you do in addition to the treatment you're providing for a patient. But in fact, that is part of, and for some patients toward the end of their lives, that is the only available form of intervention, of treatment of the patient's condition. And in those situations, a clinician has a responsibility to respond to that patient's need um, for some time, really since the 90s. In fact, since two cases went to the US Supreme Court, one of which was Quill versus Vaco, yes, that Quill, um, we think of pain as the fifth vital sign, right? and something that we ought to always be aware of, just as we're always aware of pulse and respiration, and something that we ought to always be managing as a part of the standard of care. Next slide, please. But sometimes patients need both pain management and the opportunity to refuse care even if the refusal of care is going to accelerate the patient's passing. And that speaks to that phenomenon of the double effect that Tim mentioned a few minutes ago. And when a patient is both in need of uh, 
respect of their choices, of their choice to refuse care, whether it's ventilator support or dialysis or vasopressor drugs or all of the other kinds of tubes, feeding tubes, um, that patient ought to be able to refuse that intervention and ought not to, in effect, be punished by the refusal of a clinician to manage the pain that is a result of the refusal of care that the patient has every right to exercise. And yet, when you ask a clinician of any stripe to simultaneously facilitate the withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment and intervene to manage the patient's physical pain, existential suffering, physical suffering, the combination of those two respects for the patient put the clinician in a very different ethical circumstance and one that we as people who consume healthcare, who turn to clinicians at the end of life, need to and really ought to respect in a very serious way. Because though a patient refusing life-sustaining treatment and then asking for palliation for relief of the symptoms that flow from that um, refusal of treatment, while the patient has every right to refuse the treatment and has every right to be free of pain, when you bring the two of them together where the refusal comes first and the request for palliation comes second, this is still an application of the double effect, right? The pain medication is not intended to end the patient's life, but it's very different from administering morphine for pain where you are taking those gradual steps that Tim described, what we refer to as titration of the morphine to find just a big enough dose to make the patient as comfortable as they want without doing anything that will accelerate the patient's passing by depressing the patient's respiration. When we talk about someone who is refusing care and that refusal of care creates the symptoms that the patient is suffering from, whether that's shortness of breath or actual pain or psychological pain, such as the case that we're gonna discuss in a few minutes of the patient who had flashbacks to the Nazi Holocaust, when those symptoms brought about by the patient's decision are what trigger the request for pain management and palliative care more generally, we ought to recognize and respect the fact that though the administration of the pain medication is not intended to end the patient's suffering by ending their life, pain medication rather is intended to relieve the suffering while the patient's refusal of intervention brings about the end of the patient's life, there is nonetheless a significant moral weight that goes along with asking a clinician to palliate a patient who has refused treatment that has triggered their suffering, and also an obligation to recognize that this is an actual slippery slope, right? Because any number of circumstances can bring about what the patient describes as an unacceptable level of suffering. And under normal circumstances, that is circumstances outside of this discussion of palliative sedation to unconsciousness, PSU, the physician would respond as a matter of course in providing whatever pain medication is needed. That is part of both the clinical standard of care and the clinician's obligation ethically to that patient. But when the patient is defining their experience of suffering and asking the clinician to sedate them to unconsciousness so that they avoid that level of suffering, that's asking a lot of the clinician, even though it is the double effect, 
right? The intention is merely to relieve the suffering brought about by the refusal of treatment. It is not the clinician's intention to end the person's life. That would be euthanasia. But it is incumbent upon the clinician to make the judgment that palliative sedation to unconsciousness is the best way to manage the patient's suffering and sometimes the only way to manage the patient's suffering. So if a patient is asking for it in most areas of sedation, it's an obligation of the clinician to provide it, but it is not ethically or clinically the obligation of any physician to provide any intervention that the patient asks for as a matter of right. That is to say that the patient's right does not create, does not generate a corollary obligation on the part of the clinician. Clinicians always, with only the rarest exceptions in true emergencies, the clinician always has a right to decide and it's a matter of her or his conscience whether they want to participate in any course of treatment, but especially so when we're talking about palliative sedation, and even more so when we're talking about sedation to unconsciousness, where though it is not the intention, it is clearly the effect or the result that the patient's ability to end their life by refusing a treatment, refusing a life-sustaining intervention, remember ventilator, artificial feeding, dialysis, vasopressors, is going to, with near certainty, bring about the patient's death. So that puts palliative sedation to unconsciousness right on that line between the double effect and the clinician knowingly, if not intentionally, acting in a manner that will result in the patient's passing. Now, that's the plain vanilla version of these circumstances. That's the sort of standard case, the one that we teach in the first year of medical school. But there are many variations on that theme, and those variations need to be considered as well because sometimes it's not in the order we described, pain or suffering inducing condition, patient exercising their absolute right to refuse treatment so long as they have decisional capacity, that refusal generating a set of symptoms which the physician in the first instance has an obligation to provide some management of, but where the management either isn't enough or isn't fast enough, as with the patient that Tim described who had dyspnea, shortness of breath, um, the patient may say, you know what, I want to be sedated to unconsciousness and let the disease process run its course. That's the normal sequence or that's the standard sequence. There are non-standard sequences. So the next question we need to consider is what if the patient needs both respect for his or her right to refuse treatment, either directly or through a surrogate, and the patient needs sedation in order to manage that suffering prior to death, up to and including palliative sedation to unconsciousness, where the clinician feels that that is an appropriate intervention and the best intervention she or he can offer the patient in order to give them the relief that they're looking for. So the first variation we need to consider is what if the palliative sedation is actually the clinician's idea? And what if the need for palliative sedation comes in advance of, and even before there is a thought or a reason for a thought about refusing life-sustaining treatment, how does that change the ethical dynamic between a clinician and a patient or between a clinician and family members who are the patient's surrogate decision maker? That presents an altogether different ethical dilemma 
and one which we need to address because it will enable all of you who are listening tonight to understand the relationship between the right to refuse treatment on the one hand and the right to receive palliative care, though not the same kind of right that triggers a absolute corresponding obligation on the part of the clinician to provide the kind of palliative care, the kind of palliative sedation, including sedation to unconsciousness that the patient may seek. And so when does this happen? Well, it happens in unusual circumstances, but ones that are foreseeable and quite tragic. Sarah, next slide, please. So this is a very sad story, the sad story of Ms. Geraldine Reardon, who in 2004 found herself in just the, the most unimaginable circumstance that implicated both of the topics we're talking about now, the right to refuse treatment and the right, and in fact, the need for palliative sedation, but in the opposite order. A um, wonderful article available on the New York Times website. Uh, I recommend it to anyone who wants to think more deeply about these questions of refusal of care and sedation, whether palliative incremental sedation or sedation to unconsciousness. This is the story of a woman who went in for routine care. And there on the left, you see her pictured with her daughter, and there's a photograph of her resting on the bed. Uh, she went in for a hernia repair and developed a raging infection, which, as they are wont to do, uh, seated itself in her extremities, her hands and feet. And it was such an incredibly pain-inducing condition that the very first thing that the treating doctors had to do almost immediately upon identification of the existence of this systemic infection um, is they had to sedate her to unconsciousness. And this is not an uncommon intervention in a very rare set of circumstances, such as a condition producing intolerable pain, or as was the case with another patient that I uh, consulted on, someone who was experiencing the effects of an intracranial injury that was producing such excruciating pain that there was nothing that the doctors could do in the moment but induce a coma. And that's what we're talking about here, right? Palliative sedation to unconsciousness as part of a continuum of care is putting the patient into a comatose state with the intention in Mrs. Reardon's case uh, that that was just an intermediate step to give the antibiotics a chance to treat her infection so that the pain would go away and she could be brought out of the induced coma or minimally conscious state. And um, the sad part of Mrs. Reardon's story is that after a period of treatment with antibiotics, the doctors approached um, the family, uh, in this case, a son and a daughter, and said, it's not working. The antibiotics aren't effective against this infection. And we have two choices, both of which are entirely, entirely undesirable. The choices that were presented to uh, the son and daughter were we can either amputate all of your mother's limbs, hands and feet, and then take her out of the coma or leave her with her hands and feet where the infection will invariably run its course and end her life. And that would necessitate us keeping her sedated until her life passed, right? So it's exactly what we were talking about a little while ago, that reversal of order of interventions. The palliative sedation was not thought of as an end of life intervention and refusal of treatment was not something being considered when Mrs. Reardon went in for her hernia repair, but all of a sudden, both of those choices were very much in the moment 
And the family, and it turns out the daughter, because she ultimately went to court and got appointed as guardian. And as you can tell from the title of the article, um, a family quarrel broke out. That's a, another story for another day. But the decision that Mrs. Rudin's daughter ultimately had to face was proceeding with the amputations knowing as she articulated that her mother would not want to live that way or allowing her mother to pass while sedated where the sedation isn't the cause of death but rather the circumstance of the infection with the sedation merely making it a less burdensome passing so this should illustrate the point that these issues don't always present in the simplest manner. And this is a good case to think about when we think about whether somebody ought to be allowed to simultaneously refuse treatment and ask for palliative sedation to unconsciousness when it is the only possible treatment as it was in Mrs. Reardon's case. Next slide. So um, the decision came to this, uh, Ms. Folger, the daughter said, shortly before Thanksgiving, I decided to remove her mother's feeding tube and respirator, but she was plagued with second thoughts. Quote, I have to admit to you, when she was on the respirator, it was just a comfort going in to see her. I would sit there and think of how to redesign my home for her so I could take care of her when she was out of the hospital. That's that counter-transference phenomenon that Tim referred to earlier. Next slide. So um, unfortunately, Mrs. Folger concluded that this conversation was neither a blessing or a curse, it was both. She noted in the article, the blessing was, I knew exactly what she wanted and what her desires were, and she wouldn't want to live that way. But the curse, she said, was that I knew that she wouldn't want to live that way, and I couldn't be selfish and keep her alive. That is about the worst moral dilemma that we face in bioethics or that anyone could face as a family member. And yet, in this circumstance, putting aside the ordering difference, we see a very clear indication of the most obvious indication for both the right, in fact, the need to refuse a life-sustaining intervention, the amputations, and at the same time, the um, absolute insistence that palliative sedation to unconsciousness was the only possible course. So with that as a context for our ethical discussion, I'm gonna hand this back to Tim to dive back into his three cases. Tim, back to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I get, that's back to me. Okay, next slide. <laughs> So the first case was this uh, was our Holocaust survivor who's dying of heart failure, who had the agitated delirium, nightmare and hallucinations. She was DNR, DNI. This was an, in my uh, clinical assessment, this is an agitated terminal delirium uh, that had no reversible causes and it was not relievable by usual uh, sedatives. Uh, she had a terminal illness, which was this heart failure contributing to the delirium. Uh, and this was a medical emergency. It, it was profoundly upsetting to be in this room uh, with this patient when she was awake. So we met with the family, we got consent, and uh, basically admitted her to our palliative care unit uh, and sedated her to unconsciousness and managed her with a comfort-oriented uh, approach to care. So it was really a withdrawal of treatment with very heavy sedation. Next slide. The res resolution of the second case of the uh, lung cancer patient with severe uh, dyspnea who was on the me mechanical ventilator in the past, had a long wean, uh, 
terrified of severe uh, dyspnea. And uh, um, he uh, wanted to make sure that if and when he started to get short of breath in the, in the future, that we would manage this uh, severely. So we do know that uh, uh, severe dyspnea can come on suddenly, particularly if you have advanced lung cancer uh, and no reserves. Uh, for many patients, this is more frightening than pain. Uh, and uh, this patient also had an irreversible terminal illness. And mechanic, putting him on a mechanical ventilator to address his dyspnea didn't make sense. So we reassured him that we would rapidly respond if he developed shortness of breath. We, uh, we had a well-communicated aggressive plan uh, to manage this. Again, this is this, one of the hardest things to do is, is uh, when such a patient is at home because this can happen very suddenly and getting people in fast enough, getting the medication in fast enough can be difficult. Uh, but if he uh, felt reassured that that could happen. He had a good three weeks and then he fell off the cliff, got very short of breath, and we sedated him very rapidly. Uh, and he uh, died really quite quickly once sedated because he really didn't have any breathing reserves. This really is an example of the double effect uh, where you give the, you give the uh, opioids uh, to and anxiety medicines to relieve the dyspnea. You can see this is going to accelerate death, but death is coming anyway. Uh, and it just accelerates it by a small amount. And that's not why you're doing it. You're doing it because this really is a palliative care emergency. And it's akin to somebody who's drowning, which you can relieve uh, their sensation. And Tim, Tim, let me ask you a question. In terms of your moral calculation, if he hadn't articulated that he was terrified of experiencing severe dyspnea, if this is something that that he had learned to live with and, and had accepted could be managed in other than um, use of uh, sedation to unconsciousness. Would that have changed your feelings about what was indicated and what was required for the management of this patient? I think, I think our usual approach in this circumstance with somebody who does not have, res again, with people with ordinary reserves, we're gonna be doing proportionate treatment. And we're going to try to give the minimum amount that will relieve the symptoms. In this circumstance, where there are the reserves were really, really marginal, I think it's going to be aggressive sedation, but it's going to be aggressive proportionate sedation if he hadn't had that other experience. Uh, probably would have ended up in the same way, maybe a little bit more slowly, maybe not. Uh, next slide. So uh, the 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 more challenging case in a certain way is that is our nurse with intractable depression who had tried a lot of medicines, suicidal ideation was central to his illness, uh, which was intermittent. Uh, it, he was at significant risk that he would end his life by uh, self-induced suicide, maybe violent, uh, but he did not qualify in my eyes for palliative sedation of any kind of aggressive way or any other last resort options. He had no terminal illness, and uh, altered cognition, if, if we were to sedate him, would, would uh, impair his therapy. So uh, I did uh, develop an ongoing, I was both his primary care doc and his, and his uh, palliative care doc, and he also had ongoing psychiatric care at the same time. We met every two weeks. Uh, we, he, he was able to make a commitment to call if he got close to taking his life because he thought a lot about this. Uh, there was some risk that he would do this no matter what, uh, but his suicidal uh, ideation faded over about two years. And again, I really did meet with this guy every two weeks for two years. So it was like that. It was like a short psychotherapy, a, a regular medical office visit kind of psychotherapy. I think, at least in my eyes. But again, he he survived and and went on to return to some semblance of of life for him. Next slide. And Tim, if he had decided to stop eating and drinking, how would you have framed for yourself whether as he was starting to experience the uh, physical uh, effects of stopping eating and drinking, the, the, the thirst sensation, um, how would that have entered into your thinking about the appropriateness of sedation to unconsciousness for a patient with his history? 
Uh, what I would have uh, uh, done is I, what I think I would have done is I would have admitted him to a psychiatric hospital and when that started. I would, see, I would see it as mental illness, suicidal ideation. I, I, I would not be supportive uh, of him doing that. Um, I think the fact that I, I, I think in a certain way, the therapy for him was my not being supportive of that part of him and supporting the part of him that wanted to live. He, he was ambivalent about taking his life because if he wasn't, he would have taken his life, right? He knew how to do it. Uh, so again, I, I thought that, that siding with a part of him that didn't want to kill himself was very important in that circumstance. And that is a wonderful illustration of, of sort of a, a tough case, but a clear course. Yeah. This is, by the way, a case that when you get into these, those kinds of cases, this is where you need your psychiatric colleagues and all working as a team, because this, this is murky terrain and, and very few people have enough, you know, individual experience to really know how to respond. There's a lot of things drawing you in different directions. So just a couple more slides, uh, indications for proportionate sally, uh, pallio sedation in PSU and terminally ill patients. Again, the most common ones are delirium when people are getting confused, breathlessness in a, people with bad lung disease, pain would be a, a, also a possibility, intractable seizures, people bleeding out uh, who, are, who are not clotting, uh, and bowel obstruction. So these are some very severe kind of very end of life challenging situations where you would probably do proportionate sedation because you don't have the ability to fix the problem that's underlying it and the symptoms are severe. There are psychic symptoms with these patients, but they're usually secondary to the underlying physical disease. So it's, it's a, when it's a mix of the two, it's a lot tougher. Next slide. Um, more controversial um, uh, indications when there's not necessarily uh, a terminal illness, so intractable chronic diseases, uh, diseases like ALS, Parkinson's disease, early Alzheimer's disease. I think these are tougher cases, uh, chronically symptomatic, but not necessarily terminal, and, the, and capacity may be waxing and waning. So again, these are, these are tough. Uh, agitated dementia, I think sedation is, uh, proportionate sedation is probably the right answer. Uh, and agitated, otherwise cognitively impaired patients, the never, never capacitated patients or the patients whose capacity is lost. Again, I think agitated de dementia, agitated delirium really is a palliative care emergency and proportionate sedation probably is the right answer. Next slide. Probably not indications for proportionate sedation. Again, if the, pro if the problem is pre predominantly psychiatric, it's anxiety, panic disorder, uh, depression, existential distress, spiritual distress. Again, if there's no terminal illness or no major medical illness underlying this, I think these are very challenging cases that we want to develop a partnership with our psychiatric colleagues and our, and our uh, mental health and our spiritual uh, colleagues and try to find some angles to address these kinds of issues that aren't sedation. Uh, With the, the caveat that if the patient has a serious underlying medical condition and that is the cause of their anxiety or depression, yeah. uh, how would you treat those differently? I think, I think that would be, I'd be much more inclined uh, with the presence of an otherwise intractable, progressive, probably terminal illness to, to take a look at the big picture and say, we probably don't have answers that are adequate for this and probably then sedate. Um, need for safeguards if we're gonna do this, because again, this, this is uh, where you want to have safeguards. You wanna have right people who are experienced looking at what we're doing to protect the vulnerable from error, abuse and coercion make sure somebody with palliative care experience is involved. And again, if it's a psychiatric illness, somebody with psychiatric experience. Uh, and again, we're trying to balance flexibility and accountability, privacy and oversight. Um, a, a, a sedation um, is, may have higher risk than other last resort options because they're potentially available to people with altered consciousness and no clear terminal illness. So this is how, how we deal with the tougher cases that are gray. 
which it means if you really are getting into this with a gray patient, uh, that's where you really want to get a lot of smart people who have a lot of experience to work together to, to make sure that you've looked at all, this from all angles. Next slide. Categories of safeguards, palliative care has got to be involved, got to be informed consent uh, from the patient if they're capable, from immediate family if the patient's not capable using the patient's values. Want to have clarity about what the illness is. And again, we want second opinions and really be able to document what we're doing because we're really getting off into a what potentially gray area, which is why you really want to work hard to document and not shade what we're doing, but really be honest with it. What are the risks about uh, being uh, uh, allowing these kinds of options? They may frighten some patients. They may lead to prematurely choosing death uh, based on family pressure or financial pressure could undermine progress in hospice and palliative care, and it could undermine our values if we really went to sedation too rapidly. The, the studies of sedation, by the way, between programs and between parts of the country, there's a huge variation. Some uh, programs do it a lot. Some programs do it very rarely. I think the right place to be is to be doing it pretty rarely. That would be my opinion. Next slide. So the bottom line, these options are only uh, make sense in the context of excellent palliative care. They are currently unevenly and unpredictably uh, available. Should be, uh, these should be subject to similar safeguards to other last resort options. So look at the criteria for assisted dying in states where it's legal, it should be similar criteria. Open processes are more safe and predictable and accountable than secret processes. So there is some value in really having it out in the open. Uh, and sometimes these things are needed to preserve personhood in most difficult cases. And then the last slide. So a clarity about all of these last resort options are beneficial because they can reassure those who fear a bad death, increase responsiveness to extremes of suffering, uh, more ability to address unique circumstances, and more accountability when suffering persists. I think that's my last one. It is indeed. And, and I would say of all of the scenarios we outlined just now, uh, the most morally vexing and really troubling uh, assertion you made, uh, though I completely agree with it, is the notion that um, palliative sedation, whether proportionate or to unconsciousness, is only sensible in the context of excellent palliative care. As a normative proposition, I completely agree with you. I am troubled by the notion that because someone lives in a place where excellent palliative care simply isn't available, that they have a less well-managed death than they would if palliative care were available and deemed not adequate. So that's one of the dilemmas we face. Yeah. That that wouldn't right. be true just of this option. This would be true for all end of life options, and probably true of all not end of life options, right? Absolutely, yes. So, you're, so you're absolutely providing correct. consultation to people who are in rural areas is a huge, uh, uh, important thing to do, even if it's video consultation, mm -hmm. because just having people run their cases by somebody with experience is very helpful something that the Completed Life Initiative will be doing more and more work on in the coming years. So Sarah, very are there any so. questions? Yes, very, very much so, David. Thank you, David, and thank you, Tim. This has been an incredible uh, landscaping of the world of palliative sedation. So thank you for an incredible presentation. We have many questions from the audience um, so we'll get to as many as we can tonight. Um, the first being from Juan Ricardo, he asks, um, first of all, he says, wonderful presentation from both of you, thank you. Um, he's a palliative care and hospice fellow in Florida. And his question is, what advice do you have when starting a new palliative sedation protocol? What are some challenges one might encounter? Well, you too. Tim. Uh, I, first of all, I would we we have a, a a written palliative care protocol, so I would I would uh, do some searching around. You can email me, and I'll send you our protocol. But I think having a written protocol for your institution that your inst you can take whatever we send you, 
and make it your own. So put together a team of palliative care folks and ethics folks and try to get this out because the more you have a protocol, the more you can then look at your own practice and make sure you're hitting the marks that need to be hit uh, in in the in your cases. So that's that's one thing that I would do. And then I would document like crazy what you're doing. So instead of instead of fudging what you're doing, which there's a temptation to do in these areas, I think document honestly and clearly as you can what you're doing is are, are really a good approach. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, both having a policy and procedure and and having an openness about it, not not being embarrassed about it. Very important. I, I would say that both of those steps are necessary, but not sufficient to have a successful program. To have a successful program, you have to have an enormous amount of outreach to all of the other clinicians in your institution, because if the notion that palliative care is both a special set of skills that not everyone ought to expect to have, at least early on in their careers, and that it is something that every clinician has an absolute legal, ethical, and clinical duty to refer for, just as you would refer for someone who has, um, you know, a abdominal aortic aneurysm. No GP would expect that, oh, I ought to know how to handle this. It's just not the way it works. The same ought to be your institution's norms and values for palliative care. We we review a hundred percent of our sedation to unconsciousness cases. By the way, so we have a we have a quality review of not proportionate because that's pretty common. But sedation if they end up being to unconsciousness or if they go there in one step, we review them, and that keeps us honest about what we're doing. Right. Thank you. Um, so in response to um, consulting with team members, there's a follow up question also from Juan Ricardo. He asked. How, how do you approach moral distress from other team members when you're performing palliative sedation? Well, uh, by by having you know if we're if we're doing palliative sedation on our palliative care unit, we will de and particularly if it's getting toward heavy sedation, we will have a team meeting about this. We will. Uh, have, if if we're sedating somebody to unconsciousness, we do allow people to opt out if they're really uh, experiencing a lot of distress around this possibility. Uh, and uh, but I think processing what's going on by having regular team meetings about about what we're doing both keeps us honest and also makes sure that there's that there's real conversation about what's really going on. Uh, so I think those are a couple of things you can do. Yeah, I think the other part of this is to confront the issue of conscientious objection, either to the notion of palliation to unconsciousness generally or under certain circumstances. And, and the, the model for this is uh, refusal of participation in termination of pregnancy. It's something that should always be staked out and discussed and documented uh, well ahead of time. This is not something that no one should be just confronting a circumstance of moral distress while managing a, a patient at the end of life who's seeking palliative sedation um, for the first time at that moment. That That's a system failure and that's a failure of organizational ethics. There has to, there also has to be a backup plan if you, if you are wanting to be able to mm -hmm. opt out somebody else has to be able to opt in. So it's either going to be one of your palliative care colleagues. ICU actually colleagues are often more comfortable with this than palliative care because they're used to sedation a little bit more than we are. Uh, but I, I, think opt, I think opting out is okay as long as there's somebody to pick up the baton. This is a hell of a time to be opting out if there's nobody there to pick up the baton. Yeah, there's a term for that. It's called abandonment. Right. Indeed, Brown thank you both. Yes. Um, so, uh, shifting gears a bit, this question is from Taronica Wilson, and she's asking in reference to a patient who has metastatic uh, stage four breast cancer. And she asks if a patient complains about medication interaction, such as morphine and seizure me medication causing side effects, would there have been a medication? cause um, medication evaluation done or would the medication just have been strengthened referring to morphine? 
No, I think you would you would be trying to find an angle through that by by changing to a different uh, uh, opioid, different forms of pain medicine, a non-opioid pain reliever. So, and I think if you got stuck and couldn't find an answer, if you have uh, colleagues in pharmacology, it might be good to bring them in. Uh, so I think you you really get people with expertise to to help you out. Uh, to try to find the concoction that's going to work uh, with, with that particular patient. And for the purpose of our discussion, I think the ethical guidepost is that um, the, the drug interaction and the symptoms it produces are not um, the patient's fault or the patient's responsibility. And we have an obligation to find something else that works. And that might be an indication that some form of palliative sedation is the alternative that needs to be considered. Sort of as sort of as I would I would add as a last resort. That's if, oh, if you try the other things absolutely. first and it's not yes. working. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Susan Kirschheimer. She asks, uh, would you please address the ethical concerns and safeguards for patients that are decisionally inca incapable? particularly where PSU would be appropriate. What happens when that patient has no next of kin or a designated surrogate? Your thoughts? This is a very serious ethical problem and one that every clinical ethicist um, fears having to confront. Uh, the problem of unbefriended patients is very real, even with all of the improvement we've made in surrogate decision-making laws. Uh, in New York, for example, we have a process and a system called the Surrogate Decision-Making Committee for decisionally incapacitated, unbefriended patients who have developmental disabilities, but that leaves a lot of people who aren't uh, OPWD clients who can wind up unbefriended, right? Somebody is always the last to die, and uh, we need to find better mechanisms for making end of life decisions for those patients that respect whatever we know about the patient's values on the one hand, uh, but don't leave them to their suffering for lack of a legal means for supporting decision making. What? Great, oh. thank you, David. Um, okay, so. Um, just one more question and then we'll we'll wrap up here. I um I know we're kind of running short on time. So um just a, a quick question from Dean Hart. Um he asks, uh, how do we use holistic comfort care and palliate with someone who's experiencing Alzheimer's and, and going through the the end stages of Alzheimer's kind of in the, the fast level six, seven stages? Tim, you want to take that first? <laughs> well, I would say I would say we're looking for any any avenue that might help. So holistic holistic care would be probably one of the first places to go uh, to see what we can find and being as creative as possible. Because in point of fact, medications are not not the most effective uh, means at all to address these things. A lot of it has to do with social environment and and being as creative as we can about human contact and those kinds of, um, uh, you know, hard to quantify sometimes and, and a little bit harder to provide. You know, it's easy to throw a medicine at somebody because we like to do that in medicine. It's a lot harder to think about what kind of an environment, what kind of human contact we can do. So I think you're really getting the team together and trying to brainstorm about uh, things that this person responds to. What do they like? What do they not like? And being as creative as you can be, and 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 people are the, the level of creativity is is enormous out there in many circumstances, and in other circumstances not so much, uh, and and without that creativity, I think I think uh, things can get pretty uh, plain and not good uh, for the for such patients. I don't I don't think medicines are very often the answer. They may be a piece of the puzzle, but I think it's much more the environment and social contact. That end up being key pieces of the puzzle. 
Yeah, I have a brief story I can share that sort of encapsulates the notion of creativity that Tim was just referring to. A very dear friend of mine who had been at her father's bedside all through his uh, decline um, uh, called me up one day and said, I, I don't know what to do for my father. He won't eat. I don't know, you know, what do we do? And I said, well, you know, what have you tried? And she said, we've tried everything, um, but all he wants to eat is hot dogs. And I said, well, why not give him hot dogs? And she said, well, because hot dogs aren't good for you. I said, give him hot dogs. He ate a lot of hot dogs. He passed satisfied with hot dogs. <laughs> Sort of that's comfort oriented care and comfort oriented care really is is very creative and it, it means throwing away a lot of the standard lines of approach where we are maintaining adequate hydration and nutrition. It, it does require a certain amount of letting go, though, of mm -hmm. making sure that, you know, the album is OK or, you know, the electrolytes are OK. In point of fact, if people are in comfort care, particularly with these advanced illnesses, those those pieces of the puzzle become not relevant uh, by and large, and and much more irrelevant is is the immediate uh, quality of life and comfort from the day to day activities, including meals, which could be hot dogs or whatever. Uh, analogous to a point, yeah. Analogous to a point Tim made earlier about yeah, we have an opioid crisis, but we shouldn't worry about patients getting addicted and we shouldn't um, uh, withhold adequate doses of morphine and fentanyl at the end of life for fear that the patient's gonna become addicted. That's just, that. that's a real concern that doesn't have a place in that conversation. Sure, thank you both. Um, there's actually a, another quick question that I think we can squeak in under the wire. So this is from Martha Heyman. She asks, have you, experienced an end of life doula being part of your uh, palliative care team and it, how they make differences for that team that, um, working together. So so I have had some, I've had some experiences with a doula. It's it's fabulous when you have them. And and again, particularly if if uh, if it's a fit for the psychology of the of the uh, patient and family. So if, if, the, if it is a fit, it's an amazing, uh, wonderful, uh, out, uh, out of the usual med medical box. And the medical box is quite limited in some of these do domains. So, so I would say uh, involving a doula, if you have a doula in your, in your world is, is great. Uh, and, and particularly for those who have an openness to this. So I'll open the door to a doula and if people want to walk through it, uh, if they even want to look at it, then great, we'll give it a shot. Uh, and others don't want to do it, but then they, at least they know it's there or that person might be there and they might come back to it later. But I do think we are, that, that's an example of really thinking much more at a, at a spiritual, existential, you know, different levels of, of, of uh, making meaning out of this process, which I do think is, a, is very critical to doing it well. Yeah, I have um, not, because of the nature of my clinical ethics practice, um, uh, crossed paths with a doula, and, and I, I feel sad about that. Um, it, it's in part because a lot of the work I do is remote and also because um, they're not widely available. But I, I have become more and more convinced that this is the next new profession in the healthcare delivery system, uh, particularly in end-of-life care because we are enabling people to die under their own terms. That's a good thing. Uh, but by the same token, no one should ever die alone. And so I think end of life doulas um, uh, have a, a real important place as we build out the infrastructure for compassionate and ethically grounded end of life care. Thank you so much, David, and thank you, Tim. Um, so now I'm going to jump back to our slides to conclude the evening. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us for this incredible and important discussion on palliative sedation. Um, I just want to offer a round of applause to David and Tim for, for your expertise um, on this topic. Um, and you can find uh, more about the Completed Life Initiative on our website at www.completedlife.org.
Um, I want to announce a few upcoming events that we're really excited to host uh, coming up in March. So next Thursday, March 4th, um, will be our March lunch hour featuring a, a completed life advisory board member, Paul Menzel from 12 to 1.30 Eastern. Um, following Paul's lunch hour, we have Tuesday, March 9th event, which is a community meet and greet. Um, which we'll be sending out signups for shortly. Um, so you'll receive an email with that uh, information. Um, and that'll be from 2 to 12 p.m. on March 9th. Um, and then we're also really excited to welcome back Dr. Jessica Zitter, who um, was a speaker in our fall inaugural Completed Life Conference in session two. Um, she's a tide of care and critical care uh, physician. She wrote a book called Extreme Measures and recently um, co-produced and directed a film, Caregiver, A Love Story, which um, the Tuesday, March 16th event will be uh, a film screening for and then a follow-up uh, question and answer event with Dr. Zitter herself and Rick, who was the husband in the film, who was the, became the caretaker of his wife. Um, and then we're also really excited to announce our Complete the Life March Symposium, which will occur um, from Thursday to Friday at the end of March, March 25th to March 26th. It'll be a three session event um, interspersed throughout the day on Thursday and then carrying on into Friday, March 26th. And our keynote speaker will be BJ Miller. Um, registration information is coming soon, so please stay tuned for that. Um, and, and we'll be delighted to welcome you back to these future Completed Life events. Um, please tag us on social media, hashtag Completed Life. Um, if you're on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, we would love to connect with you and carry on the conversation um, that began in this event uh, with David and Tim that has begun in previous Completed Life events and that will continue on uh, in future events. So we're so grateful for your uh, engagement and participation today um, as always. And I look forward to welcoming you back to our next Completed Life event. Be well, stay safe, wash your hands, and uh, until next time, be well.